Hello everyone and welcome, I'm the Retro Repair Guy. Today's episode is an idea that comes from Plex and Brown, one of the users uh, who wrote a comment on one of the last videos. Um, now his request was actually that it'd be a top 10 list of things that are easier to fix for beginners. So what I did is I, I had to dig in my head a little bit because I thought like, okay, some things that are easy for me might not be easier when you're, you're a beginner. So I made a list, there's no particular order, there's no harder to easier, it's just uh, 10 items that I believe are easier for beginners and I'll explain and go through all of them and why what I think but I also separated the show into two parts I made a part one where it's going to be just 10 items again no particular order there's no top 10 here it's just 10 items that I believe uh, all users that are uh, beginners excuse me that are going to be getting into electronics or want to do some projects at home part-time uh, these are 10 items that I believe you should have on hand all the time if you're going to be doing that and yes, I'm leaving you some affiliate links uh, on the bottom. And then after that, the second part is just going to be 10 items that I believe are a little bit easier to fix. And I'll show you some uh, pictures of the boards and a few things so we can uh, take a look at that more in depth as to why I think they're a little bit easier to fix. All right, uh, so let's just go and dive in. Even if you're a beginner, I recommend the 60 watt soldering iron, especially if your intention is to do more than one project. Depending on the solder you encounter on the board or the type you decide to use, there might be a higher melting point and 40 watt oftentimes just doesn't cut it. Also, it's not necessary to get a big brand name. There are some great little stations out there that cost a lot less and get the job done. The most important thing you'll want to look at is the tips that can be replaced when needed. Besides price, they often come with extra features such as digital display that allows you to set it to the desired temperature. The only downside when you're a beginner is running the risk of running it too hot for the application and burning right through the board or sometimes lifting the traces right off the board. A good average would be to run the iron at 365 to 374 degrees Fahrenheit or 185 to 190 degrees Celsius. Solder is not just solder. There are many types for many applications. And while we're not gonna go into the nitty gritty of it, for general electronics repair, I suggest a 0.8 millimeter 6040 lead Rosen core solder. 6040 represents the mixture of tin and lead. In this case, it's made of 60% tin and 40% lead. 0.8 millimeter is the thickness. It's what I use in 95% of my projects and it's great for beginners as it melts at lower temperatures and creates a strong bond. It's not much use to have a soldering iron and solder without a desoldering vacuum pump. There are expensive electric pumps and these could prove useful for certain jobs, but a cheap $10 manual pump should be fine for most jobs. You want something that is easily operated with one hand while you hold the iron in the other. This is why I like small pumps as opposed to large ones. It's important that you clean the pump after each use as it will help keep a strong suction. When working in electronics, you'll notice that the most popular is the Phillips head. However, you can't get away with a simple flat and Phillips or cross head screwdriver. There are many gadgets and game consoles that use hex or torques. While you can't be expected to own every type, a small kit containing a mix of all these is a good place to start and should cover most of your projects. You'll also want to have different sizes. A tiny flat head, for example, can be very useful in unconventional ways to facilitate access to small areas.
In general, and especially as a beginner, you'll be testing continuity, the occasional diode or resistor, and check for AC-DC voltages. You don't need anything fancy if you're working with low voltages in electronics projects, but you will want to stay away from the extremely cheap ones as they might give you problems in accuracy when testing, and being made of cheap components, the probes and dials can break easily. Something in the $50 range should do just fine. Magnifying glasses or loops are not just for half-century old and tired eyes like myself. They help identifying components much better and help you be precise when soldering. The last thing you want to do is weld two connection points on the board that shouldn't be connected and... Well, you get the point. While there's not much to say about pliers, you don't want to be using vice grips or plumbing tools on the electronic boards. I recommend you get yourself some needle nose and bent nose pliers. They'll help you with a slew of things in various applications. While it's not something for everyday use, if you intend to restore any old computers or keyboards, I suggest getting a keycap puller. It helps pull the keys straight out and grabs the key from underneath to avoid damaging them. A universal power adapter is something extremely useful to have when repairing old components, especially if you pick them up at the thrift store. It could be missing or in bad shape. I recommend an adapter that can vary from 3 to 12 volts and up to 2 amps with reversible tips as some components require positive and others negative polarity. Basic shop supplies you should always have on hand include alcohol. While 99% is preferable, you can use 70% rubbing alcohol. It's a standard go-to cleaner for boards, tape heads, CDs and more. Contact cleaner, swabs, electrical tape, solder wick, solder flux, some wires for repairs and jumpers, and a roll of paper or shop towels. Okay, so before we begin, I just want to explain something. Now, this is a, a double-sided board with a lot of surface mount. It's an Xbox motherboard, by the way. So you want to stay away from these things. Now, you can pick one up at the thrift store for 10 bucks. Great for experimentation. Have fun with it. But as a beginner, I wouldn't necessarily expect to fix it right away, okay? Unless it's something small. The thing is, is that you see there are tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, components, and this is called surface mount. Now, there's a lot of surface mount you require, a heat gun, and even though I have trouble with that, I'm not ashamed to admit it, I have a lot of trouble even uh, after all these years with surface mount. You have to be very careful. And uh, at the same time, it's a motherboard that I don't know, they, they use some kind of lead-free solder, so you have to really crank it up and not burn through the board at the same time. So it's, a, it's, it's difficult, okay? They're not easy boards. And uh, what you want to do is try to stick with older components that have just one-sided, where the components are going right through. So capacitor like this, legs are going right through, and it's not soldering on both sides, okay? Because even the Sega Genesis I did in the last episode, the capacitors were actually welded on both sides, but it was a little bit easier to do, okay? Much easier than, than a board like this. Um, so for beginners, again, I'm always talking for beginners, you could uh, attempt on a Sega Genesis, you just got to watch my video and you'll see, you got to melt the solder right through, and I, uh, I show a little bit of it where you have to um, make sure it's soldered on both sides, okay? But you want to stay away from things like that. So anyways, let's just go and uh, take a look and I'll show you uh, each component, a bit of the motherboard, how it's made and why it's easier to do. In vintage amplifiers, the capacitors tend to be fairly large and the boards are single-sided boards with lots of space on them to work and the components are generally much easier to access. For beginners, this makes repairs much easier. The only downside is that you might be faced with challenges of finding equivalent parts, but you have to have some fun. PCRs are pretty straightforward, besides also having lots of space to work in them, often they only require head cleaning and belt replacements. Occasionally, you'll need a head demagnetizer for VCRs. When I talk about walkie-talkies, I'm talking about the old ones. Not these uh, tiny little things. Obviously, they're tiny. You can see that they're going to be hard to work in. There's going to be probably some surface mount and little components. We're looking at these babies. These old things from the 1980s. Uh, yes, this is from uh, Stranger Things, by the way. It's unopened. There's still a price on it. Yes, I've got a couple of them. <laughs> Anyways, I'm not showing off. I'm just telling you, by the way. Uh, look at the size of these, okay? So inside, um, 
there really is big components and they're easy to open and they're sturdy. So these go ahead, you can open them up, fix them. A lot of times the capacitors do need to be changed in them after all these years and they work incredibly well, by the way. Uh, so uh, yeah, beautiful, beautiful units. So I just wanted to tell you the difference when I'm talking about walkie talkies, okay? So not those little things, these old 1980s uh, things. Always the older, the better, big, bulky stuff, always easier to fix. CRT televisions and monitors are fairly simple to work in and even to diagnose. However, please be warned that working in a CRT TV or monitor is dangerous and can still hold a charge even when unplugged. I've already mentioned the complexity of the Xbox. However, there are some retro game consoles that are pretty easy to fix. The Atari 2600 and Sega Genesis both have double-sided boards, but they're units that are easy to open and work in. The PS1 is another example of that, as it's probably the simplest unit to open, and while the board has some surface mount, its power supply is easily accessible for repair and restoration. This is not a course on capacitors, we could do another show on it another day. I just want to explain to you a couple of things when you're going to be ordering your capacitors. Now you may have uh, heard me talk about brands and stuff like that and I'm not going to talk about brands here, I'm not pushing any brands. Uh, sometimes I'm just telling you what I use, okay? I like a lot of the uh, Japanese made um, capacitors. But I just want to explain to you a couple of things. So this is what you call an axial capacitor. Okay, so the legs are on each side like that, so you can fold it and it's, you know, in a uh, horizontal position on the, uh, on the motherboard, all right? So it's lying down. So that's called an axial capacitor, and these are radial capacitors. Okay, so they are the same, well, uh, we're talking about electrolytic, right, uh, capacitors. Now, electrolytics are the same in the sense that there is a negative side and a positive side, and it's always indicated. So here there's a big minus that is indicating where, you know, with an arrow, which is indicating where the negative side is. And here, the same thing, a negative, which is the negative side right here. So they're the same inside, they're made the same. Um, you know, if you were in an old component, like uh, there's a radio I fixed from 1963, a Shaw Lawrence, uh, a couple episodes uh, ago, and I couldn't find, I could only find it in this, uh, kind of form and not this form because it was so old, you know, you can bend the legs and put it in, it'll still work, okay? But in a everyday component such as, you know, amps and stuff like that, you shouldn't have any problems and you shouldn't be using that instead of that only because of the form. The other thing to uh, make sure of is if it says, for example, here it says 330 microfarads, you've got to get a 330 microfarads. You can't play with that. What you can play on is the voltage. So for example, if it's a 10 volt and you can only find a 16, 25 volts, like more than 10 volts, great. So as long as it's above the same or above, it's not a problem. But you can't take a 10 volt to replace a 25 volt. But you can take, you know, a 25 volt to replace a 10 volt. Now this is important that you know these things because when you're going to order a lot of times, uh, you know, and they're, they're actually made a lot smaller today than the old ones. So you can go ahead and put a 50 volt. All it's going to do is actually uh, give it a, a higher, you know, a longer lifespan, I should say, because it's going to be less prone to heating. Uh, it can take a little bit more. So there's no problem, okay? What you got to watch for is height and width, okay, on the motherboard. But like I said, a lot, of, especially when you're fixing old things today, um, a lot of our newer capacitors are made smaller, but double check that anyways, that you, you cannot replace it with something that let's say it needs 20 volts and the other one's 200 volts, but it's this big, it won't fit on the board and sometimes the lid won't close. So just make sure you check that. But otherwise, you know, changing a, a 10 or 16 volts for a 50 volts as of the same size, Perfect. Go ahead and do that. All right. So that's all I'm going to tell you about capacitors. I'm not going to stay an hour talking about them and it's not a course about capacitors. Uh, but especially if you're changing old uh, things and like old units, you're trying to restore them, you know, 30, 40 years old, go ahead and change the electrolytic capacitors. The ceramic ones are fine unless they're broken, but this is something you want to future proof uh, your units with. Turntables might look complicated, but if you've ever used one, you're halfway there. 
If belt driven, you can easily access and change the belt from underneath, and the components are also easily accessible. If you plan to fix a few, it might be a good idea to invest in a stylus force gauge and cartridge alignment tool. Vintage computers like the TRS-80, the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20 are easy to open up and great for beginners to restore. The only downside is when you need to troubleshoot the ICs on the motherboard, but these particular computers have a plethora of sites giving detailed support that it makes the repair fairly easy. Cassette decks are another easy fix, normally only requiring head cleaning and belt replacements. You might struggle a little at first with taking apart some tape mechanisms, but they are well worth the time. You can pick up old radios for a few dollars at the thrift store, like this Shaw Lawrence from 1963 and this Lloyd's handheld from 1970 that I only paid $3 for. Like the walkie-talkies, they have larger components inside, make for great restoration and are good collector's items. CD and DVD players are some of the most inexpensive equipment you can pick up at thrift stores as there are tons being donated all the time. Many are easy to fix requiring belts and laser cleaning with some alcohol and you can have fun welding and restoring them without spending too much money. Thank you Plex and Brown for the idea and I hope it helped you, I hope it helped a lot of you. Uh, when you're a beginner I can't show you how to fix and go into details but I can definitely you know, set you on the right path. And in my shows, I try to go in details as much as I can, but I don't want you to watch me solder for half an hour and be kind of boring. Uh, so I'm trying to just show you the basics and go on. But there's a lot of great books out there, a lot of great videos that go in detail. Um, so anyways, thank you. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, do everything that you can do to help the channel. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.